Shalom, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Light on the Rock. Welcome from wherever you are around the world, hearing this or reading this. Today I want to talk about disciples of Jesus Christ, or as I often call him by his Hebrew name, Yeshua, the name his mother uh, gave him. It means salvation. How would you have liked to have been one of the chosen 12 original disciples? And do you know you do have that opportunity to be a disciple, a learner, a follower of Yeshua today in the 21st century? When someone referring to Christ's followers mentions the disciples, who do you think of? What do you think of? I think most of us would think of the 12, right? Well, you probably already know it, but we also know that there were far more disciples, even thousands, than just the 12. Certainly scores and scores, a few hundred in the beginning, many left him from time to time. And you probably think of the male disciples. Well, ladies, you're not being left out. Wouldn't you have loved to have been a disciple of Jesus Christ? When I was younger, I often mused and thought about, man, that would have been a, a really cool thing to to have been a disciple of Jesus Christ. Watching him do his miracles and speak and teach, listening to his teachings, that would have been so exciting, wouldn't it? And then I got older and I began to realize, wait a minute, I'm living in the most exciting time at the end of the age, the time the prophets wish they could understand more, according to Peter. And yes, I can be that disciple of Jesus Christ, and so can you. We must be disciples of Jesus Christ if we're being called by him. So if you and I wanted to find other disciples, let's say you think you are one, how would you know for sure that you are one to begin with, and how would you find other disciples? Well, the Bible gives us signs to look for. There are really quite a few, and I have time to cover maybe six or seven of them. I have seven in the, my notes here, and, and, and points that, to make sure you're a true disciple. Now, besides the chosen 12 leading disciples, there were many, many more. Remember when Yeshua sent out 70 disciples? 70 disciples, you can read that in Luke 10, verse 1, 17 to 20. Many of them came back thrilled. Why? Because they were able to cast out demons. It was exciting to do a miracle. It is exciting when God uses you to do miracles. But Yeshua told them, be even more excited, be even happier, that your names are written in, the God's, in God's book of life, he says in Luke 10, verses 17 to 20. And so those 70 make, make, make my point that there were more than just the 12. And also a big point for you, if God called you to be a disciple of Christ today, you are as much a disciple as any of those that we'll be reading about from the Gospels in the book of Acts, except maybe the actual 12, of course, because they are going to have their names on the very foundation stones of the temple, I mean, of the New Jerusalem, I mean. Anyway, be sure... Uh, that we're living out the signs that God said would certify that we are true disciples or not. Also be aware, and let's clear something up real, real quick, we're the disciples only men. Now, if you're still thinking the 12, you'll say, yeah, they were only men. But again, remember, there were many followers of Christ who were female. In fact, on just before the day of Pentecost, there were 120, according to Acts 1. Be turning over there with me, Acts 1, verses 12 to 17. I want to read especially verse 15, but Acts 1, verses 12 to 17. And uh, I'll just read that. It says, They returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olive, Olivet, Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, and they list the twelve apostles. And verse 14, These all continued with well, 11 apostles now at this point, because Judas, was, Judas Iscariot had, had died. And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So Jesus had brothers and sisters. He had a mother, of course. 
And uh, so his brothers, by this point, were convicted uh, that he was the Son of God. The brothers would be James, who wrote the book of James, and Jude, the one who wrote the book of Jude. And in those days, verse 15, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. So by the time we come to the day of, or near the day of Pentecost, we have 120 disciples, and women are there. Mary, the mother, mother of Jesus, and the women are mentioned here. So I just want to make the point that, yes, women were also disciples. We know Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, Martha, and Mary the sister of La- the sisters of Lazarus. Others like Timothy's mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois, Lydia, Yodia, Syntyche, mentioned in I think the Book of Philippians, who are the, the first converts in Philippi. In Acts nine, it talks about Tabitha or Dorcas, a disciple. Uh, Acts nine thirty six, another woman. And then there was Priscilla and Phoebe and the the deaconess who delivered the epistle of Romans to the church there, apparently. So I'm just mentioning these are people who are called disciples in the Bible. Uh, Certainly Dorcas or Tabitha is called a disciple. And so please, ladies, you are part of the picture very much so uh, as much as the men. So as I speak of discipleship, please, ladies, You are included in my mind and in Scripture. Remember, in Christ Jesus, there's no more male or female. Galatians 3, 26 to 28. Remember that the sisters Mary and Martha followed Christ, and they, along with Lazarus, had him often stay at Martha's home. Do you remember Mary, the sister of Lazarus, being commanded, or commended, I mean, for sitting at the feet of Jesus while he taught? You can read that in Luke 10. If if you're not familiar with the story, just write this down, look it up later. Luke 10, verses 38 to 42. But she was sitting at his feet, it says, hanging on every word. She wanted to be a disciple in every way. And so literally they would sit at the feet of the teacher. And uh, the earliest disciples, in the strictest sense of the word, meant people who followed Christ He calls them to follow him. They stop what they're doing, whether it's fishing or mending nets or whatever, and they follow him with no reservation, no pause, no delay. Uh, Matthew, the Levi, uh, the tax collector, was at his booth collecting. He just stands up and follows Christ. And you can read those examples in Matthew 4.19 and Matthew 9.9. They begin following a new master. We can't serve two masters, so they became disciples. Now, you have been called by Jesus as well to be his disciple. Father is the one who opens the door. Jesus opens the door to the Father. Father opens the door back to Jesus. I believe, um, we've often believed that God the Father was the one who does the actual calling, and I think that's still true. But when it comes to actual calling the disciples, uh, Jesus was the one who went around calling them to tell them, hey, stop fishing for fish, and I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Anyway, whoever calls you, Father Jesus Christ, you are being called to be a disciple. And the original disciples did drop everything and followed him. Those early followers are not called anything, by the way, but disciples in the gospel accounts. They're not referred to by any other name. That's it, disciples. Now, later in the book of Acts, they're called believers or Christians. Uh, but that's, that's many years later. And after the gospel books, they're sometimes called believers, like in Acts 5.14 and uh, 2 Corinthians 6.15. So the words disciple, disciples are used a total of 290 times in the New Testament. So it seems to me that there's some deeper meaning to disciple than most people realize. I think this is an important topic, therefore, if it's used that many times. Ananias, not Ananias and Sapphira, but the other Ananias, uh, who was in Damascus, is called a disciple in Acts 9. Paul tried to uh, join the other disciples in Jerusalem, but they were afraid of him. Timothy is called a disciple in Acts 16, 13. So there's certainly lots of disciples besides the 12. 
Excuse me just a second. <clears throat> and you can be Yeshua's disciple today, okay? And the early disciples, by the way, were just like you, very human. Uh, Yeshua had asked them to Peter, James, and John, would you please stay awake here with me when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? What did they do? They fell asleep. And then they flee uh, from the armed band who came to arrest Jesus just when he needed them most in the Garden of Gethsemane and instead of sticking with him. So they weren't perfect. Uh, they sometimes squabbled between themselves, often did. Uh, they sometimes tried to uh, put themselves in positions of power, just like the people do today. Remember uh, James and John, uh, the mother, came and said, can one of them sit on your right and one on the left? And and that upset all the others. But still, they changed the world forever. Once they were converted and transformed, if we learn from what happened to them, we too can be a force that changes the world today. But first, he said before we can change eternity, God has to change and transform us into true disciples of Christ. And I think it's very, very exciting. So um, we have to be transformed first before we can change the world. Just a second, I was making myself a note. So those 12 chosen apostles, including Math Matthias later, were ordinary people in so many ways, but our leader Yeshua transformed them. There were also secret disciples. Now, that's not so good, except the two I'm going to mention uh, came out of the closet of Christianity uh, at, at the, a very crucial time. They were secret no longer. Do you know who I mean? One was Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews. And um, he came by night in John 3, verse 1 and 2. And then also at the end, when Jesus is killed, crucified, it mentions that Joseph of Arimathea, uh, John 19, John 19, verses 38 to 39, John 19, verses 38 to 39, mentions that Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple. Many believe that he was actually a, a relative of Christ, maybe an uncle, a rich uncle. Um, and Joseph of Arimathea was the one who collected Jesus' body from Pilate and got Pilate's permission and buried it in his own tomb, which means he was a wealthy man to have it all carved out of rock. And he had some help, it says in John 19, verses 38 to 39, from Nicodemus, who also was wealthy, because it mentions that he came with a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes, which would have been very, very expensive. And at this point, they come out of the closet and are no longer secret disciples. And tradition says that Nicodemus was banned from, uh, from being a ruler of the Jews and a leader and all of that. And uh, sort of kicked out of the synagogue and eventually killed and, and uh, buried in a common grave near Stephen. Uh, with Stephen, uh, the one in Acts 7. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what tradition says. But don't be a secret disciple of our Savior. In that day, a disciple of a particular leader or rabbi was proud of his master, teacher, proud to be a follower. He would tell everybody, at least well pleased, maybe if I can say that. <coughs> but remember that Yeshua warns us, warns us all that we can't be a half-hearted follower. If we're ashamed of being a Christian, Yeshua says he will be ashamed of us before his father and the angels. Are you? Are you ashamed to openly declare that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? And some of, the, some of you in some of the countries you're in, there are a lot of people in China and Russia listening to this. For example, I don't know how safe it is for you to come right out and say you're a disciple. I don't know. And I commend you for learning of him where it's not so safe or, or open to do so. Um, do your neighbors and friends, though, especially those of us in the Western world where we can still say we are Christian or followers of Yeshua, 
do your neighbors and friends know you are a disciple of Jesus, or Yeshua as I call him? Do they know it? Or are you kind of hiding it? Kind of making, are you kind of keeping it secret all this time? If it was a crime to be a follower of Christ, someday it might be. Someday it might be very dangerous to be a Christian. Any of you in the Muslim countries, um, or countries that have a lot of Muslim population, uh, the, the radical Muslims are killing Christians in many of these countries, in the Sudan and Morocco and, and uh, Syria and so, so forth. But anyway, if it were a crime to be a follower of Yeshua, of Jesus the Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you really understood what it means to be a disciple, you would not be able to contain it inside you. You would be so happy about it. You would be, you would, you would have to, uh, that you're now chosen as a modern day disciple, very special. Out of billions and billions who have ever been born, you, we're chosen by God the Father and Jesus Christ to be a follower of Christ, to be his disciple, a child of God today, and perhaps be part of the bride of Christ, part of the first fruits, the creator himself, the great I am who I am, Jehovah in heaven, has put your name in the eternal dream team of heaven. Your name is being written in the book of life, has been written. Your name, it's an opportunity if you have ever been offered one that will never be repeated uh, in the same way, the opportunity. We must not treat it lightly, nor be ashamed of it. And if we're ashamed of being a Christian, he will be ashamed of us. That's what he says and warns in Luke 9, 26. <coughs> Excuse me. We've already seen that the disciples put their calling first. They were willing to deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow him. We've also seen that disciples were about openly believing in Jesus. They didn't try to hide it. And uh, certainly as you read the early chapters of the book of Acts, uh, they took beatings for it and everything else. But before looking at some of the biblical signs, I want to review historically what it meant to be a disciple of of a famous rabbi in the day when Jesus was preaching. There's a book called Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus, Chapter 2. That's what I'm referring to here. Sitting at the Book of Rabbi Jesus. And the author points out that the disciples in Yeshua's day were expected to know their teacher's teachings by heart. By heart. Many rabbis had followers or disciples. The disciples of Yeshua called him rabbi on numerous occasions. Matthew 26:49, Mark 9:5, Mark 11:21, uh, many many times. If you have a concordance, you can see that they called him rabbi many times. He was a rabbi. The word rabbi literally means my my master. It was used in the sense of teacher. Uh, teachers of scripture were called rabbis as an act of respect. In the Hebrew word picture, by the way, it means my great one. Uh, Jesus came out later on and said, hey, don't don't you guys be calling yourselves rabbi. You're not a great one. I, I, there's one teacher, one rabbi. That was him. Um, he's the son of God after all. It was after the temple destruction in 70 AD when the term apparently became uh, formal, formally used, according to this book anyway. And then every Sabbath, the synagogues would have a member of the congregation read a designated part of the Torah or other scriptures. Torah means the law in English, but it really means teachings or instruction, the way it's understood among the Jews or Hebrews. So someone who was not Torah observant would have never been even invited inside a synagogue, let alone allowed to teach or invited to to teach and speak there. So we know Yeshua, who never sinned, obviously was Torah observant, at least the written part of Torah. Yeshua often did spar with the Pharisees over their traditions, the so-called oral law. You might have heard of that term, the oral law, that Moses supposedly passed on to the 70 elders who were on the mountain with him for part of the time. And uh, the way it's taught is that God, Moses wrote down the rules that all of us must have, and we all can see that and read that and so forth. And, but the uh, really good stuff, the oral law was just passed on to the 70 elders. 
and they in turn uh, pass it on to other elders, rabbis, and teachers, and so on. And um, that's a bunch of baloney. Uh, look at Exodus 24, verses 3 and 4. That's why do not, Jesus constantly was saying, your traditions have ruined God's law. Why do you make null and void the word of God, the law of God, the commandments of God, he said, by your traditions? You know, you can read that in Matthew 15 and other places. So, uh, he was constantly, why do you have this law that I can't do anything good on the Sabbath? That's not God's law, that's your tradition. He never broke God's law, not a single time. He couldn't have, or else we wouldn't have a Savior. So there are some verses in John where it says when he broke the Sabbath, or he was accused of breaking the Sabbath, he could not have broken the Sabbath according to God's law and still be our Savior. He broke their traditions. In Exodus 24, verses 3 and 4, did Moses, in fact, not... Uh, or did Moses, in fact, just have oral laws that he taught to the elders and nobody else? And were there some secret information and all that? Well, in Exodus 24, verses 3 and 4, let's read it. So Moses came and told the people, all, the people, not the elders, the people, all the words of Jehovah and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which Jehovah have said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of Yehovah. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and so on. My point is Exodus 24 verses 3 and 4 makes it very clear several times that Moses wrote all the words of Yehovah. Okay? Some of you say Yahweh. Yahweh or Yehovah. I say Yehovah. And he rose early in that morning and wrote all the words, okay? Exodus 24, verse 3 and 4. So this notion that, the, in fact, a lot of the Jews give more credence to the Mishnah, the Talmud, the oral law that finally was written down by their leaders than they do the written word of God. They think it's, a, they think it's equivalent to the word of God. Anyway, I go by the written word of God, not the traditions of man, Okay? And uh, Hebrew roots, Messianic people, please note that. Too many of you are going down the path of of uh, traditions and the traditional prayers, the traditional hand washings. I've been to some services where they had the uh, the tradition, the you know, the traditions of hand washings and so forth. That's not in Scripture. In fact, you find that Jesus Himself railed against it. He railed against it. And they were angry at him for not doing the ceremonial uh, hand washing. So why are we doing that today? We shouldn't be. When, when Jesus himself says that's a bunch of nonsense, you know, wash your hands, uh, to be clean, sure, but not the ritual washing. I know the priest had to wash before going into the temple, but you know what? Follow Jesus' example. Anyway, in the synagogues, rabbis would also have to been asked to teach, and so we see uh, Jesus, Yeshua, preaching. And studying the scriptures was considered the highest form of worship among Jews, sometimes even above prayer. The way they looked at it is when we're praying, we're talking to God, and but when we're, when we're studying his scripture, he's talking to us. It's actually not far off on that. The best rabbis went way beyond just teaching the way of God, like in a classroom setting. You know, we have this Western... Um, uh, Platonic way of teaching, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, you know, those guys. And we have their schools and all that. Well, that wasn't the way they did it back in Jesus' day. They were supposed to have absorbed the Torah so much that they embodied Torah. So the early disciples of the rabbis were expected to copy everything their teacher did. Not just what he said, but what he did. People studied not just the words of the rabbi, but the life of the rabbi. How did he conduct himself? Not just to glean information, I want you to get this, this is a key point. Not just to glean information, but to be transformed to think and act and move and do just like their teacher. Being a learner or disciple meant learning from what their leader did, not just what their leader said. In our, in our Western world, we put so much emphasis 
on information instead of the purpose of the information. What is the purpose? It is to be renewed in our minds, to be transformed. So often we're fascinated by teachers who have something new we've never heard before, like the ancient Greeks. But we should rather be more fascinated by teachers who bring us to a closer walk with our Savior, who show us things that transform us, things that change us, things that make us more like him. So next time you're fascinated by some new point, ask yourself, how is that making me more like him? How is it leading me more to Christ? So anyway, the disciples of those days literally apprenticed themselves to a rabbi, and I'm quoting from the book now, sitting at the feet of Jesus, or sitting at the feet of Rabbi Jesus. They apprenticed themselves to a rabbi because the rabbi, I'm quoting, had saturated his life with scripture and had become a true follower of God. Disciples sought to study the text, not only of scripture, but of the rabbi's life, for it was there that he would learn to live out the Torah. Even more than acquiring his master's knowledge, he wanted to acquire his master's character. Yeah, I mean, the, you, you see why you will, we're going to read some verses where Jesus says, hey, follow me and learn from me. So we need to emphasize that all the study we do is not just for the sake of information and knowledge. Knowledge can puff up. But for transformation, that's the essence of discipleship. It's wanting to be transformed, wanting to be just like your master. So let's look into the seven biblical signs of disciples. I've been kind of talking about one already. Number one, a true disciple, seven biblical signs of discipleship, okay? That's the subheading here now, or or the whole sermon, really. A true disciple of Christ most must profoundly believe in him and what he did and who he is. A disciple of Christ has to be a believer. A true disciple is first and foremost a firm believer in the Son of God. I can't imagine being a genuine disciple of anybody unless you profoundly believe in him. A true disciple realizes Yeshua was the word of John 1, verses 1 to 3, who spoke all things into existence except man and woman. He didn't speak them into existence but he personally fashioned and breathed his breath, something of God, into the man, and by extension the woman who came out of the man later. We know Yeshua was the one who spoke the words, let there be light. Yeshua was the one who came as the Son of God and took all your sins upon himself once and forevermore. That's in Hebrews 10. And Then he sat down because his that finished the work of being a sacrifice, it was done. That part of his work was done. Whereas it says the human priest stood because they had so many things that had to keep having to be done. And they had to do it from month to month, year to year. Whereas he died once for all, forever, for all sin, forever, and sat down because he finished. And his, and his offering covered all of us. I've got to believe that. You've got to believe that if you're going to be a disciple. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a bad cough for some reason, suddenly. Yeshua is the Holy One who is perfect and willing to live his life again in you. Okay? Turn with me to John 5, verses 38 to 40. John 5. John 5, verses 38 to 40. But we, we have to believe in him. A disciple accepts him as your personal savior. A disciple believes so deeply in him we die for him. A disciple believes so deeply in him that a love bond is growing more and more deeply between you and and Yeshua. You love him more today than you did yesterday. In John 5, verses 38 to 40, speaking to the Jews of his day, you do not have his word abiding in you, Because whom he sent, him you do not believe. He was talking about himself. I'm the one being sent. You don't believe me. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these very scriptures are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you might have life. 
So that's the whole point, is we have to believe. He said, he said um, you don't have his word abiding in you because you don't believe in him. One of the early descriptions or descriptives of a disciple after the Gospels, as we get into the book of Acts, like Acts 5.14, for example, Acts 5.14, they were called believers. Believe what? Well, there are many scriptures we're going to read that Christ was God in the flesh, the Son of God, and that he lived a perfect life and offered that life, his life, to pay for your sins and mine and our sin debt. And that he loves you and wants to save you from the penalty of sin. It means you believe in this finished work of our master who sat down on the throne of grace with his father, says in Hebrews 10, verses 10 to 13, having finished that work of atoning for our sins by sacrifice of himself. It means believing in that and paying that he paid for all of your sins for forever. Go back and read Hebrews 10, verses 10 to 13. Surely I don't have to requote John 3:16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever believes in him it goes on to say that those who believe are saved and those who do not believe are not going to be saved if they don't start believing. Okay? True modern-day disciples believe in him so much that this is what they mostly think about, and they want to share that word with others. In fact, the point of all preaching, including this one, should ultimately be to draw people to a believing relationship with their Messiah, which is what I'm talking about. That's the point of all preaching. Those true believers, in turn, become as one body. Look at John 17. John 17, verses 20 to 21. Here Jesus was praying at the final uh, dinner, Passover meal he was having with them. And he says, I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me, those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may be one as we are in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. See, the word believe is here constantly. And then uh, that's the work of God in John 6:29. Turn there with me, if you would. John 6:29. People often try to define what is the work of God. Well, the work of God is whatever God's working at at any particular time. But the ultimate point of the work of God, certainly from the time of, Je- of Yeshua until now. John 6, 29, here he defines what the work of God is. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. God is working to have a group of people, a group of disciples, including you. I hope you're getting excited. If you're hearing this, you may be one of those being called by God the Father and Jesus Christ to become a disciple of Jesus Christ who believe in him. That's the work of God, John 6, 29. I hope you're turning and reading these in your own Bible. I hope you're doing that. Believe in him whom he sent. In 1 John five thirteen, and there are so many of these verses, 1 John five thirteen. these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Okay, so that's why they're called believers in the book of Acts. In, book, in the Gospels, they're called disciples. And, and, and once the Holy Spirit came, many of them were called believers. In fact, there's a story in Acts 8. You know, uh, Philip uh, is notices this man reading in a chariot, parked his car, on whatever, <laughs> He's reading Isaiah 53, <clears throat> which is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And he says, how am I supposed to understand this if no one explains it? So Philip begins to explain how the entire, what we now call a chapter, I don't think they had chapters back then, but that entire passage was about Yeshua and what he did. 
the eunuch is being called, he's converted, he's wanting to be baptized, and he says, what's well, hindering me from being baptized? And now go back and read Acts 8.37, and what Philip says to the Ethiopian eunuch is very telling. If you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, you may be baptized. And he was then. That was the criterion for baptism. Repent, and in that repentance you believe that Jesus Christ forgives you your sins by his atoning sacrifice and that he's the Son of God and therefore his one life covers all the billions of human beings who've ever ever sinned and lived and died. And so all of you in China who accept Jesus as your Savior, Yeshua, hallelujah, praise his name, you can be saved as much as anybody in America or England or France or Russia or Bolivia or Peru or Brazil or the Philippines. Are we getting that? So the first point is a disciple, first and foremost, is one who believes and is a believer in Yeshua. Now, the second point, that profound belief in Christ, as we've already been saying, is transforming you to be more and more like Christ. It's about transformation, not information. We are to grow in the knowledge, yes, of our Lord Jesus. But the point of it was like Jesus, like I just read in John 5, that the, in the scriptures they speak of me, okay, he said. And the point of Bible study is to learn about Jesus and be transformed. The verse that goes with Luke, I mean the second point about being transformed is Luke 6, verse 40. I wish you would turn there with me. Luke 6, verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Luke 6, 40. A disciple is not above his teacher. A disciple, it's us. The teacher, that's the rabbi, that's Yeshua. But everyone who's perfectly trained will be like his teacher. That's my second point. A real disciple will be like Christ. Paul talked about helping the Galatian brethren grow, he says in Galatians 4.19, until Christ is formed in you. And there you have it. Until Christ is formed in you. True disciples are living like Christ more and more. If you and I are not becoming like our teacher, are we really a disciple? Luke 6.40 again, a disciple will be like his teacher. And that absolutely was the criteria back in the day. So this is why I was talking earlier about transformation, not just information. Disciples in the day when Christ walked the earth watched their leader carefully. They mimic, mimicked him. The rabbi just didn't teach the way. He lived the way. He showed them the way and the way he, that they should go. Now, not all of them did it well. Not all of them did it with right motives. A lot of them got uh, criticized by Christ. But disciples were learning by watching that man's life, his actions, okay? Not just the words he preached. So fellow members of the body of Christ, this is what our lives are all about. It's about our relationship with Messiah uh, that's only possible by us having a life that's in the process of being completely changed, completely transformed. When you're in a strong relationship with a make, our Maker, is when we'll see Him and grasp Him and hear His voice more often, be transformed. We're starting to talk and live and act as we grow up in Him, as children of God. You know how children will walk like their father, sound like their father, gesture like their father. We do the same thing, and, and, and Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so, what's my point? Besides coming to live and die for mankind, Yeshua also came to raise up a team of disciples, including you and I, 21st century disciples, who are people who are becoming just like him. This is what Paul meant when he said he wanted nothing more. He says this in Philippians 3 that I may know him. Everything else is done, he says. Everything else is gone. All I want to know is to know him and the power of his 
resurrection. He didn't say, I want to be in the resurrection. He said, I want the power of his resurrection, his Christ's resurrection. What did he mean by that? He meant we disciples must let him live again, this time in us, transforming us by his presence, cleaning out the junk in our lives in repentance and washing it by the washing of the water of the word in baptism. The resurrected, resurrected Jesus is to be walking the earth again, this time, though, through you, through me, through thousands of other people being led by his Spirit and are being changed powerfully by his Spirit. And yes, I preach to myself, I must be changing also. I know a lot of changing must yet happen. That's why a lot of us repent a lot. But keep in mind, that as I talk about Jesus living perfectly and us becoming more and more like him, only Yeshua can be perfect like Yeshua. Only Jesus can be perfectly Jesus. I can follow, I can mimic, I can learn, but in the end, I want Yeshua to live in me. I want his life. I want to be in him and let him be in me. He wants to live and walk the earth again, this time in you and me, and he will. Again, in John 5, 38 to 40, you search the scriptures for them. You think you have eternal life, and these are they which speak of me. But you were not willing to come to me that you may have life. John 5, 38, 39, 40. So remember that disciple means a learner. A real disciple is learning everything he can about his master. Now, our English word disciple, first of all, the, the, the Greek word disciple is uh, mathetis. And like mathetes, uh, it means a learner, and it's the one always used of a pupil, and it's someone who accepts the views of his teacher, and that he is also in practice an adherent of the teachings of the rabbi. But our English word disciple comes from a Latin word, discipulos, meaning a scholar. But that implies classroom learning. That implies book learning and not transformation and not by learning, but just by watching everything the master did. I mean, when you read the Gospels, these disciples, they traveled all over with him. And they, when he slept, he, they slept. And when he was in a boat, they were in a boat and so on. So our Bible studies to primarily teach us how to be more and more like him it's not the scholar so much as the learner, okay? And when you study God's word, pray about it first. Ask God to transform you with those words. Ask God to introduce you to Yeshua. Ask, ask Father in heaven to help you see Yeshua in the things you're reading in Scripture. So many things, are, there's a physical example, but we need to be looking at it from a spiritual point of view. So don't just learn new stuff. Learn things that bring you into a closer walk with your master and change you, transform you. I had a man tell me recently, yeah, but it does say we're to grow in grace and knowledge. I said, what does the rest of her say? He wasn't sure. So I said, let's open it and read it together. Second Peter 3.18 Growing in the grace and knowledge of it says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? There you have it. He is the living word of God. He wrote the book. Remember that we are not just to learn the book. We are to learn the writer, the author of the book. We want to get to know the author as much as the book itself. Okay, so that's the second point, is that disciples are being transformed. They're learning so much about their leader, about Yeshua, that it's transforming and changing them as they build this very intimate and close relationship. All of the Bible is about a relationship, remember. All of it is. <clears throat> Number three, true disciples obey and do what the Master says to do. John 8, 30, 31 is your key verse here. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. And then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you, he said, okay, believing is a big part, 
But that's not where it ends. Another sign that you're a disciple is this one right here, John 8, 31. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. A lot of people think the only sign of being a disciple is that you love one another, John 13, 34, 35, which we'll come to later. But right now, I'm showing that there are many other verses that define who a disciple is. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples. Abiding in the word, not tradition. Abiding in the book of of God, not, not oral tradition. Not what you think the Bible says, but what it actually does teach. Another translation, or paraphrase, says, You are truly my disciples if you keep obeying my teachings. So there we have another definition of disciple. In 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6, 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6, By this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. Okay, 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6. I'm reading verse 4 now. If you say you know Christ, but that but you teach people we don't have to keep the commandments, all ten, not just nine, all ten, including the Sabbath, he says, if you don't keep the commandments, you're a liar. The truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, 1 John 2, verses 3 to 6, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we're in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. We have to obey. We have to be like him. And if we're going to be like him, we're going to be obedient. So here's where the rubber meets the road. Are we seeing growth in our desire to obey God in the areas especially that are pet sins? What commands are we still refusing to obey? What sins are we coddling and hiding? What's your bowl of lentils for which we would give up everything, like Esau did? We all have those weaknesses. We all have those sins. Excuse me. We need to understand in the end, true disciples are obedient. They're obeyers. Yeah, we stumble. Yeah, we still fail to walk the walk from time to time. I have and you have failed. But a true disciple keeps getting back on that right path and back in tune with the Master and asking him to please live more strongly in my life. Please change me. Help me be the kind of husband I want to be. And I really want to be the kind of husband I, that you tell me to be, God Almighty. But I fail. I fail as a man. I fail as a husband. I fail in so many ways. Live in me. Very simply, God's word on this point. 1 John 5, verses 1 to 3. 1 John 5, verses 1 to 3. Whoever believes in Christ, that Christ is born of God, everyone who loves him, who begot also loves him, who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome or grievous. 1 John 5, verse 3. Remember when Jesus was being tempted by Satan, he said to live by every word of God. Don't pick and choose what you want to decide to keep and obey. Husbands, yes, we are to love our wives. Wives, yes, you are to submit to your husbands. That's absolutely true. And so I hope that we're doing it. I hope you're coming to that point of obedience on the things that you find hard, that I find hard. It's hard to be a husband like Christ. And that's my model. It's hard to be a wife like the Bible says you're to be. It's hard. I'm not saying anything otherwise. So um, please, please, ladies, understand that I understand that. It's hard to be the kind of parent the Bible says to be. It's hard to be the kind of child the Bible says to be. It's hard to watch our thoughts from being sinful thoughts. But we must obey. We must also look at what our secret sins are. What are our secret sins? Sins we know are wrong, that we kind of put up with. 
Are there secret sex sins, secret drink drinking sins, secret sins of Internet? What is it? Yeshua says, we've got to start obeying. That's number three. Number four. True disciples have a deep love for one another, a love that's just like the love Jesus has for us. This is the one you're probably most familiar with, John 13, verses 34 to 35. One we're familiar with, but we're not very good at, frankly, as children of God. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you love one another, by this all will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. By this, this incredible agape love, that's the kind of love that Jesus himself had for us, will be the thing, the very thing that will mark you, sign you, define you as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful to visit a home where you can feel the love the husband and wife have for each other? Sometimes you feel a tension. Sometimes in your own marriage there's a wonderful, loving relationship. Sometimes there's a tension. Or where the children and the parents love to be with each other. God's household must be the same. Or those simply are not the disciples of of God. This deep agape love that disciples have becomes so obvious and so evident that others are drawn to it. They like it. I remember a lady calling me years ago and said that her sister started attending our congregation and she said she's just changed so much. I want you to do for me whatever you did for her. I'm sure it wasn't me, but Yeshua, Jesus, who had done it for her. But her sister was impressed by the changes she saw in the loving nature of her sister now who had become a disciple. Unfortunately, we see so many among so-called believers, even ministers, who ban their flock from visiting other ministries. All too often within the body, we see infighting, politicking, bickering, gossiping, backbiting, striving for power and position. We have pastors acting like lords over the flock of God. It's not even their flock, but the flock of God. Acting like some tyrant, even though First Peter and Jesus and others have said, don't be a lord over the, over the flock. He said, don't lord it over like the Gentiles do. Be a servant. Well, those are not true believers who do that. I recommend you hear the series I gave that started in October 2009 about the one body of Christ and how we must start coming together. We should not let just some of the differences of opinion or beliefs keep us apart. You can't read the book of Romans, the book of Corinthians, for example, without realizing there were deep-seated difficulties and differences of beliefs among the brethren. Some were saying there was no resurrection, that some were taking each other to court, Some were getting drunk. Others were teaching that we should all be vegetarians. And on and on. But my point is they were all part of the body of Christ. They weren't thrown out. Paul worked with that. People will know we're true disciples of Christ when they see us truly following Christ and living his life of love and affection, forgiveness. Remember on the cross he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And if you read the end of Matthew 5, do that on your own. For time's sake, I have to skip over it. But the end of Matthew 5, where God, Jesus, is teaching us, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, Matthew 5, 44 to 47. Do good to those who aren't doing so well by you or to you. Pray for those who are treating you badly that you may be sons or children of your Father in heaven. Because he makes it rain and shine on the good and the bad. That's the way we're supposed to do. He says, if you love only those who love you, verse 46, Matthew 5, 46, what reward do you have? 
Even the so-called evil tax collectors do that. They love each other. So if you just love the people at your fellowship, if you just love the people who go to your church but not people who from another group or another religion, what kind of what kind of a Christian is that? So we must, we simply must be coming together and showing that love for one another, being kind hearted for one another, and not just to those in our congregation, but to those, like I say, anywhere, any human being made in the image of God. That's number four, that we must love one another as he loved us. The way he loved us was he loved us while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners. Point number five, true disciples. Are you a true disciple? Let's read another sign in John 15, verses 7 and 8. Please turn there, John 15, verses 7 and 8. If you abide in me and my word abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. But by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciples. He says right here in John 15, 8, that one of the signs of being a true disciple is that true disciples are bearing much fruit. You and I must be different today than we were last year, than we were 10 years ago. The New Living Translation, or to paraphrase, says, My true disciples produce much fruit. This brings great glory to my Father. So John 15, 8 says, If you're going to be a disciple, you've got to be growing. So look in your fruit basket. Is it brimming with fruit? Or is it empty? True disciples don't just bear fruit, but much fruit. And we will, if we're letting the first four points I've been talking about already, work in our lives. Fruit is not the same as growth. You have to grow before you have fruit. A plant does. Bearing fruit is not the same as growing. Growth, spiritual growth is good. It's needed. It comes before fruit. In the end, God wants to see fruit. What's fruit? We have the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. It's the evidence that God is working in you. It's the evidence that He is being productive in our lives. We're letting Him be in our lives. Fruit gives. Fruit sustains. Fruits nourish. Fruit strengthens. Fruits are giving something to others for others. Our lives need to become lives that do all the above. Giving, sharing, sustaining others. Feeding, building up, strengthening. If you're doing all of those things, then perhaps you are bearing fruit. If you read the story in the uh, parable of the sower in Matthew 13, you can see that some ground types, like stony ground, thorny ground, um, they didn't bear much fruit because the thorns choked the word or the stony ground dried up the growth in a hot day and so on. And so... When you look at your life, and if you can see or I can see that I'm not bearing much fruit, what I feel I've got to do, maybe you've got to do, in a case like that, would be to say to the groundskeeper, to God, the Father, the, who owns the, the lot, please work with my ground, my mind, my heart. Make me receptive to your words. Please soften the rock. Take away the rocks from my heart. Take away the thorns from my life. Please help me. Now, if you, if you pray that prayer... Uh, he will answer, and it may not be very pleasant at times as he yanks out some thorns around your life and digs up some rocks around your life. But if we're not bearing fruit, we're going to get pruned pretty severely and uh, down to what's decent and strong, the roots and the main trunk of the vine, which is Christ. We uh, recently did a tour of some wineries a few while, a little while back, and we learned a lot about the vineyards and grape Grape vines. One thing we learn is that too much sun and water produces a lot of fruit, but not good fruit. So the vine dresser told us that grape vines put down the deepest and strongest roots when it's experiencing some hardship, maybe a lack of rain for a time. I suspect thought of trials. I immediately thought of trials that allow us to go through. That God allows us to go through, knowing we will send down some strong roots during that time. 
of trial. In John 15, verses 1 to 5, let's read how to bear fruit. John 15, 1 to 5. I am the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that doesn't... That's why I said talk to the vine dresser and say, please uh, work with me and help me be more productive. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. That it may bear even more fruit. So if you're dead, you're going to be cut off. If you're productive, you'll be trimmed. And then uh, verse 4, abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you by yourself. You can't do it. That a branch that's been cut off of the tree is going to die. So he says, stick to the tree, stick with me, stay close to me like a good disciple would do, like the first four points I've given. I'm the vine, John 15, 5, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. There's the key to bearing fruit. Spend a lot more time talking to, listening to, studying the Word of God, praying, thinking about being with Yeshua, he who abides in me will bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So we have to stick to the vine, and we have to also make sure that we're receptive to the Word of God. A person, by the way, who's full of godly fruit is going to be a humble person, like an apple branch, heavy with fruit, its branches full of apples hang down low to the ground. Remember, too, that fruit is for the benefit of others. If your basket is empty, ask yourself if you're abiding in him enough. So point number five, if you're a true disciple, you are changing. You're bearing fruit. You're bearing fruit of the Spirit. You're a giver. You're humble. You're providing sustenance. You're nourishing others. You're helping others. That's what fruit does. So as you look for true disciples, look not just for those who are following Christ and obeying his word and who love one another, but also those who have good fruit in their lives. They're changing, growing, and helping others. Um Many of us, including me, have had some bad fruit in the times of our life. Well, let's hope those times are in the past. And and we have to learn to forgive one another. After all, Christ forgave you and forgave me while we were sinners. And we have to look at the present life of a person, not what they did 5 or 10 or 30 years ago. In uh, point number 6, a true disciple of Christ is willing to take up his cross and follow him no matter what to the ends of the world if need be. A true disciple of Christ will take up his cross, meaning the hardships that are that we're allowed to go through or that are sent to us for testing and trial and growth, and we endure to the end and love him to the end. In Luke 14, verses 26 to 33, the counting the cost passage, Luke 14, 26 to 33, if anyone comes to me and doesn't love less, is what he means here, not hate, his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So a disciple has to love God, has to love Christ more than father, mother, children, or wife, or husband, or brothers or sisters. Otherwise, you cannot be his disciple. And, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And he says, if uh, you're going to try to be a disciple, he says, consider whether you have enough to make it all the way to the end. 
with God's help, if you're going to build a tower or a house or something, you have to see if you have enough to finish it, he says in verse 28. So verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, in context, that means to endure to the end, cannot be my disciple. Jesus said, if we're really to follow him, we must take up our cross daily. Luke 9, 23. Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Every single day we're willing to go through whatever we have to go through as a Christian. And so we're told in many scriptures that we enter the kingdom of God through much tribulation and persecution. And we're coming to a time in the end here when there's going to be tremendous persecution. And I hope we're getting ready mentally and spiritually for it because it's going to be a tough time. I do recommend, since it says take up your cross, that you hear the sermons I gave, if you haven't heard them already, on the series of Galatians 2.20. Uh, You'll find those in March 2007, May and June 2007. March, May and June 2007. I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The life I live is by Christ living in me. Uh, there's a three-part sermon like that. I recommend you hear that, that series. Crosses are not very convenient. They're certainly not very comfortable. They're certainly not nice. They're not beautiful. They're very painful. Very ugly. They wouldn't feel good or make us look good. I speak as a fool. The early disciples often were killed. Many of them were crucified. The early disciples by the hundreds. Remember, James was beheaded. So was Paul. We can read in Acts 8 that there was strong persecution after Stephen's martyrdom. And there's coming a time of the greatest time of trouble the world's ever seen. You will mark yourself. God will mark you as a true disciple. If you hang on to the end, hang on through whatever he allows you to go through. Take up your cross daily. Love him more than anybody else. That is also a mark of a disciple. Finally, another sign of a, of a true disciple, number seven. They also have another sign. They keep the seventh day Sabbath and the annual Sabbath. Many miss this point. The annual Sabbaths are also God's Sabbaths. Many miss it because they think the Sabbath is only for Jews or Gentiles, I mean, Israelites. Remember, the Sabbath was made by God in creation week as a gift to Adam and Eve. They were the forefathers of all humanity. This was done at creation long before Mount Sinai. It was something God created by putting his presence in the seventh day. Yeshua taught that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, in Mark 2, 27. The Sabbath was made for man, he said. We're all the Israel of God, so even if you think it was for Israel, <clears throat> in the New Testament it says that one is a Jew who is one inwardly, Romans 2, 28, 29, 27, 28. Romans 2. And it's clear that Paul kept the Sabbath. It's clear Jesus kept the Sabbath. It's clear that it's one of the Ten Commandments. There's no clear scripture at all that says, that anywhere that says, now we have changed the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day. And we know Paul kept it on the seventh day in Acts 13, 14, and 17. You can read about those. And if you have questions about that, I'd recommend that you go back to my sermons that I gave in 2008, a three-part series proving the Sabbath is to be kept today and that the Sabbath is the seventh day, certainly not the first day of the week. It's very important that you prove that to yourself because this is a sign of true disciples. Now, if all they have is the Sabbath and they don't have the other six signs, they're still not disciples, or vice versa. 
The Sabbath was given as a sign of God's people when God was working at the time just with Israel. You can read that in Exodus 31:13. Now God is working with all nations. Exodus 31:13. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, "Surely my Sabbath," he says. Exodus 31:13. My Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. It is a sign that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. In verse 17, it's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Exodus 20, verse 12. God, in explaining why Israel went into captivity, he makes very clear, as you read the whole section around this verse, Ezekiel 20, verse 12 and 20, and the verses in between. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them and me, that they might know that I am Yehovah who sanctifies them. I do find it interesting that those who continued to keep the Sabbath among among the tribes did not lose the, their identity. The Jews know who they are. The other so-called lost tribes of Israel never returned, and they never kept the Sabbath after that, and they've been lost to their identity. Many of us believe that those are the nations of Northwestern Europe, United Kingdom, Canada, United States, Australia. Those nations don't keep the Sabbath, and they've lost their sign. The other sign God gave Israel, of course, was circumcision, but that is kept today by circumcision of the heart. Romans 2, 28, 29. So there are two, so there too is another sign, but it means conversion. It means uh, circumcision of the heart. If you're still thinking that the Sabbath was really something just for Israel, Israel go back and read with me now. <coughs> Isaiah 56, verses 3 to 7. Isaiah 56, verses 3 to 7. This is a prophecy about the foreigners. And in the millennial times, we know they're going to be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. Zechariah 14 says all the nations uh, will be sending their representatives to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. If they don't, they're they're not going to be blessed. They'll have some curses. Read that in Zechariah 14 if you're not familiar with it. But in Isaiah 56, verses 3 to 7, Don't let the son of the foreigner who's joined himself to Jehovah say, Jehovah has utterly separated me from his people. And don't, I, I don't want the foreigners thinking they don't have a part of me, he's saying. You people from China, listen. You people from Kenya, Listen. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am a dry tree. For thus says Jehovah to the eunuch who kept kept my Sabbath and chooses that which pleases me and holds fast to my covenant. Even to them I'll give them a place in my house. I'll give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. He says, You are going to have a really good spot with me. Listen, you people from Kenya. Listen, you people from Brazil. Listen, you people from the Philippines. Also the sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to Jehovah to serve him. Mexicans, South Americans, Central Americans, Asiatics, listen. Isaiah 56, 6, to the sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to Jehovah, to the Lord, it says in your your Bible, to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, or Jehovah, to be his servants, Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations." So there you go. I mean, he's saying specifically the way we interact with him on the Sabbath is something that he notices. So, i got to wrap up. If you're looking for true disciples that will acknowledge, they will acknowledge the Sabbath day is still to be kept today. There are ten commandments, not just nine. God didn't erase the fourth one, the Sabbath one. 
But there are a lot of Sabbath keepers who are not true disciples. Uh, they aren't obeying the rest of the God's word or, or loving their brethren. They're keeping Christmas and all that kind of stuff. True disciples have all seven points. So what are the proofs again? True disciples absolutely believe their leader and confess him openly. They're believers, okay? They believe in, in Jesus Christ. True disciples, number two, are being transformed. They're living, walking, and doing just like Christ. They're acting and living more like him every day. Christ is being formed in them. Number three, true disciples obey what they read in God's word. They obey what they read in God's word. They don't follow traditions. They don't follow Christian, so-called Christian traditions of Easter and Christmas. They see what the Bible says. They keep the holy days of God, not the pagan holidays that go way, way back. And they don't steal. They don't lie. They don't, they don't commit adultery. If they did, they repented of those things, put it behind them. I've, I've had a lot of sin in my life. We all have, but we have to repent and move on. We're becoming more and more like him. And they obey, point number three. Point number four, true disciples are deeply, deeply loving people, very kind, and, 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 and they forgive easily. They're coming together as one, one group more and more. They're not bad-mouthing other groups who are believers. They're not doing that. Number five, true, and you ministers who keep people away from other ministries, you got to stop doing that. Be a real shepherd who watches over the flock but encourages them to meet other, other sheep as well. Number five, true disciples are changing. They're bearing much fruit. They're growing. They're, they're giving. They're, a fruit gives and nourishes and so they're, they're, they have a lot of fruit in their life. They're doing better this year than they did before in the way they are living their lives. Number six, true disciples endure to the end. They love Christ more than anyone else. They're carrying their cross. They're going through whatever God sends them to go through. And they love him more than anybody else. Number seven, true disciples also keep the Seventh-day Sabbath and all the holy days of God mentioned in Leviticus 23. I'm really gratified to see more and more people are doing those. So we've been called by Jesus to be his disciples. What an honor. It's very special. Very few are being called right now. Many are called. Few are cho chosen. Cherish that calling. In fact, I may follow this up with a study on cherishing our high calling. But let's be sure we act and look like and are those disciples, just as identifiable today as they would have been in the days of the book of Acts. And with God's help, let's help each other grow. We can be disciples God's well pleased with. We've slipped a ways in the last few years, but we can wake up and get back in the life of being a disciple. What an awesome reward you and I will have if we respond to this calling to become true disciples of Jesus Christ and find the others who are true disciples and let's come together. Feel free to email me, please. Call me, email me, go to the contact me section of the... I would love to hear from various ones of you. There are literally hundreds of thousands of hits and visits to the website. And so thank you for coming to it. And if there's things you need, I'd be glad to serve you. And, and just tell me what you need, and I'll, I'll try to put it on the website. I'm not a church. I'm just a human being, one man, trying to get the Word of God out. So it's all for now. Have a wonderful day, you modern-day disciples. I wish I could meet you all. It's an honored calling. This is Philip Shields saying, until next time, may God be with you always, and may His face shine upon you with joy and delight as He thinks of you. Bye-bye for now. Until next time.